Hello and welcome back to Math 301 Introduction to Combinatorial Theory here at Colorado State University. Today we're going to be talking about the arithmetic of counting. So we're diving into chapter two now and we've finished up chapter one in this course which was the overview introduction to what combinatorics is. Now we're going to start building combinatorial theory from the ground up starting with the basic principles of what is addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division, what do they mean in combinatorics? How can we use them to count things? So let's start with the addition principle, which says if a collection of objects can be split into two different collections of sizes A and B, then in total there are A plus B objects. Let's count these fruits, for example. How many fruits are there? Well, we could say, let's first count the apples. There's three of them. And then let's count the oranges. There are four oranges. And so altogether, there's three plus four fruits. This may be a type of problem you've seen before, uh, but as we'll see, it's a very powerful principle in general. Um, and let's look at some other examples of where the addition principle comes up now. For example, what if we wanted to count the number of squares that you can find by tracing out edges on this three by three unit grid? So each of these little squares we're assuming is a one by one square, and we wanna find how many squares can we find in total? Well, first let's count the one by one squares. There are nine of them if you just count them. You can see there's nine. But they're, they're not the only type of squares. We can do another case where we look at all the two by two squares. So here's a, an example that I outlined in yellow. The upper left corner contains a two by two square. In fact, each of the four corners of the grid contain one two by two square. So there's four total two by two squares that you can find in this grid. And then finally, there's a three by three square. The, the total outline of the grid is three by three, and there's just one of those. So that gives you another case. So what we've done here is we've split up our counting problem into cases where we sorted the squares by size. And we said each square is either size one, two, or three, and we're counting those cases separately and adding them up to get nine plus four plus one, which is 14. So that's an example of where we use the addition principle in a slightly more complicated context. It's not always obvious what cases you should split your problem up into, but in this case, counting them by size was useful. Let's consider another example. How many dots are in this four by five grid of dots? Well, one way we could do it is count them by row. So there are five dots in the first row, five dots in the second row, five dots in the third, five dots in the fourth. And so by the addition principle, we can add them all up and say five plus five plus five plus five is 20. Now, if you're familiar with addition and multiplication, we recognize this as five times four, which is also 20. That's another way of doing it. But this leads us to the multiplication principle in combinatorics. And the multiplication principle says that the number of ways to choose one thing out of A possibilities, and then also one thing out of B possibilities, is A times B. In this case, a dot in this grid can be thought of as choosing a row that it's from. Let's say we choose that row. We're choosing one out of four of the rows and one out of five of the columns. And a row and a column uniquely determine dot in a grid. And so that, since it's a four by five grid, we know the number of possibilities is four times five, which is also 20. So that's a different way of, of approaching it. Let's see how the multiplication principle comes up in other contexts. Here's a classic example. If you have 15 shirts and eight pairs of pants, how many outfits can you make? An outfit, of course, consisting of one shirt and one pair of pants. By the multiplication principle, we have to choose one thing out of 15 and one thing out of eight, which is 15 times eight, and that gives you 120. Here's a, a more sophisticated example. How many three-digit numbers have only even digits? So let's write the three-digit number as ABC, and we're trying to figure out how many possibilities there are for A, B, and C. Well, since the digits are even, each of A, B, and C can only be 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8, but A can't be 0 because otherwise it wouldn't be a three-digit number. You need to start with something non-zero for it to truly have three digits. And so B and C, however, are unrestricted. They can be any even digit, 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. And so now we just count up the possibilities for each. There are four possibilities for A, five for B, and five for C. And by the multiplication principle, since we're choosing one of each, we multiply them together to get 100. So there are 100 three-digit numbers that have only even digits. Let's now see an example where we combine the multiplication and addition principles. How many three-digit numbers have either all odd digits or all even digits? 
And as a tip, as a general tip for solving problems like this, solving counting problems in general, whenever you see an or, you should think addition principle. There's a couple cases here. Let me solve them both separately and then add the results together. And often means multiplication. If you're counting uh, something and then something else or all possibilities, that's a multiplication problem. So let's split this into the two cases given by the or, the odd and the even. Starting with the odd, how many three-digit numbers have all odd digits? Well, again, thinking of it as A, B, and C, now A, B, and C can be any odd digit, one, three, five, seven, or nine, because none of them are zero. It's all fine. So each of them has five possibilities, and now we use the multiplication principle again. Five times five times five is 125. So that's one case. Now let's do the even case. For the even case, we already did it in the previous problem. If you remember, we counted how many three-digit numbers have all even digits. It was 100. So now by the addition principle, we can add 125 to 100 and get 225. So we split this problem into uh, two separate multiplication problems and then added them together at the end. Here's another example. How many three-digit numbers with only even digits are not divisible by 10? So when you see not, that's a hint to use subtraction. So here we're going to build up to the subtraction principle. Let's first interpret what we're counting here. The ones divisible by 10, the numbers divisible by 10 are exactly the numbers that end in 0. And so when we want to count the ones that don't end in 0, let's count the ones that do end in 0 and then subtract them from the total. So that's, a, that's an example of where we might use subtraction in counting. So let's rephrase this again. How many uh, three-digit numbers with only even digits do end in zero? Let's count that first. Let's look at again A, B, C as our three digits. Well, A can be two, four, six, or eight. B can be zero, two, four, six, or eight. And then if we're mandating that it ends in zero, then C can only be zero. And so we have four possibilities for A, five for B, and only one for C. So we only have 20 possibilities that do end in zero. And now remember that we already found out the total is 100, the total number of three-digit numbers with only even digits. And we're subtracting off the ones that end in zero. And we get 100 minus 20, 80 remaining are, are not divisible by 10. So let's state the general subtraction principle now. If B things are removed from A things, then A minus B remain. Again, a simple sounding principle, but very powerful when you use it in difficult problems. Here's just an illustration of this. If we have six apples and we take away two apples, we are left with four apples. So there's six minus two equals four. Next time we're gonna be talking about division, which is a little more involved and combining all the principles again. Um, but for now, it's your turn. Now you try. How many triangles have their edges in the grid below? So before we saw a grid of squares and you counted the, the squares by cases, Try the same thing for triangles here. How many can you find? So that's all, and we will see you next time.